wanted to stop and take a, a look at this beautiful dignity statue and look at her she's absolutely gorgeous she's a Lakota woman who has been presented with a star quilt which represents honor and integrity and I just absolutely am blown away by how beautiful it is and when you feel the wind hitting your face you you can feel it and it's almost as there's movement through the sculpture and the, the different angles that they've created with this this beautiful beautiful work of art Hey guys, this is David McKay with Photo Enthusiast Network, and uh, as you just heard from Allie, how beautiful this sculpture is, I now want to take you through some ideas to photograph something like this. Now the idea is we are already dealing with something that was created that's a beautiful piece of art, so we need to make no mistake about it, this isn't about uh, our art, this is about the artist that has created this beautiful statue dignity, but how can we capture that with different perspective and power? And, you know, one of the things that happens a lot of times is people get out of their car at a rest stop, they've got one lens, in this case I have a wide angle lens on, uh, but I want to talk about some different perspectives because you'll see we've got people that are walking around, so sometimes we can get different shots. I'm going to use two completely different ranges. I'm going to use a wide angle lens to show you how powerful that can be when we take perspective and we actually uh, use what's not really correct perspective, but to create something of strength and power, which the statue dignity is. I'm also going to use the complete opposite end of the range, a 100-400 lens. So we're going to have some in tight close shots of some of the spectacular details of this statue. Okay, so I've been taking some of these shots with the 100-400, I've been moving back and forth. Uh, there's a few little tutorials within this tutorial and you know obviously we're talking about different gamuts of lenses for perspective. The other thing we talk about a lot in all of our tutorials and on our tours is to move your move your feet. You have to move your feet. So I've taken all these shots from this one angle and a lot of times I see people and that's all they do. Well, before I change lenses and do anything different, I'm gonna walk around the statue, keep my 100 to 400 on, and look for different angles. And those images are what you're gonna see next. Okay, so I've been moving my feet, I've been walking around and you know, you're gonna see people, picnic areas, garbage cans, restrooms, and yet this beautiful statue. And what I noticed was this amazing <laughs> natural frame. So again, there's some tutorials within this tutorial. So lens perspective, moving your feet perspective, natural framing perspective. And here I can basically step back and I can frame her with this beautiful greenery which right now we're in the middle of the day and it's beautiful against this blue sky. And so just natural framing is another perspective. So as we move and move around, we see these different things you have to be looking for. Uh, don't just take quick one shot and you're done. Spend some time photographing, trying different angles, different lenses. Okay guys, so Allie and I are just really enthralled with this. It's an amazing statue. Look at the clouds going on behind it. So in the middle of this tutorial, uh, Allie said, I gotta get my black and white infrared camera. Uh, those that have been following us know that Allie loves her infrared, but bright midday is actually the best time and she loves clouds. Now notice where she's shooting at. She's shooting with a wide angle lens. So that's what I was talking about is that we were gonna use a wide angle lens, but knowing this light and this clouds and everything that's going on, uh, Allie went and got her black and white infrared and these results are what you're gonna see here. Now the wide angle is not proper perspective, but it's powerful, powerful, powerful perspective, especially because it gives you such a difference of size and power, and because the perspective is actually not correct, it creates strength. So Allie? Yeah? Can you talk about what you're shooting here? I've been following you around, and I know we, we went off script with this tutorial because it's so amazing, but what, what's going through your head right now as you're shooting? Well, I just really want to cover this from different angles, and I came back to um, this uh, kind of left side, um, kind of a split profile of her face, uh -huh. and the light is um, just skimming off her cheek and, and her chin, and I find it shows a lot of 
depth and dimension. And I'm just playing around with different composition with placing her in different areas of the frame within the sky. I'm gonna include the sun um, flare in a few of them just to see what that looks like. So you're going to notice the light keeps changing as well, right? It comes in and out of those clouds, so it gives us different perspectives. Hey, Allie, did you notice that the artist, so what's one of the tutorials? Do you remember the tutorial you did about eyes, uh, catch lights? Yeah. Check that out. I noticed that when I was shooting at the long lens, but the artist purposely put catch lights in those eyes. And what does that do for a subject? That's the life in, in the eyes. Catch light is the life, and it's the light that comes in, which is just makes it look much more realistic. Right. So without those catch lights, it would almost look flat, huh? Right. Those yeah, catch lights. She, yeah. She really would, adds. She wouldn't some. have a lot of sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So look how close that she is to that statue, and we were way far back earlier, and now she's going to move in even closer. I don't know how tall the statue is, but it's got to be at least 30, 40 feet. It probably says on the sign. But look at how close that she is using that wide angle lens. Again, getting completely different perspective. You just can see in these clouds, my gosh. So just because it's midday doesn't mean that it's a bad time to shoot. Sometimes it can be an incredible time to shoot. It doesn't have to be, you know, sunset, although that can be awesome too. Exposure is basically taking a picture and the settings that you're using to take that picture so that it looks the way you want. And that's what a correct exposure is, a picture that you've taken that looks the way you want. So it doesn't necessarily have to look the same as what your eyes are seeing for it to be correct to you. But in this case, we are going to use that as an example. Um, based on what my eyes are seeing, I'm going to set an exposure of a scene and just kind of walk you through uh, the options you have to change to create a correct exposure and things to watch out for as you do that. So let's just real quick, I'm in um, Scene Intelligent Auto. I'm on the green A. We're just gonna stay here for just a second. I'm gonna press the Live View button. And here is the scene we're looking at. We have some flowers. And for those of you who have watched my other videos, you know right now I'm sitting under uh, this big skylight. It's an overcast day, so I have nice diffuse light coming in. These, uh, this jar of flowers is at the edge of that skylight. And beyond that, it starts to get pretty shadowy fairly quickly. Uh, you can see there's a ruler and there's something white back there. We're going to be able to see those things in a moment. But here's what the camera judges to be a correct exposure of this image. And it's pretty close. But, you know, you, the camera doesn't always decide what's best. And in this case, to talk about all of our options that we have to change, I want to switch to manual. And so that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to rotate the dial to M. And you should follow along. Feel free to follow along. I think this is going to be worth uh, a lot more worth your time if you have your camera in hand. And it doesn't matter if you have a Canon T4i or a Nikon. The, the general uh, settings that we are talking about are identical for all of these cameras. So here I am in manual mode and very nicely across the top now, I have the three options that I want to talk about when you're setting an exposure. Your first is your shutter speed. That is the length of time that your shutter remains open when you take a picture. Right now, uh, it is set on one five hundredth of a second because last time I was taking pictures, that's what I had it set on. And it remembers that and it keeps that uh, there until you change it. Next, I have aperture. I'm just going to press Q and highlight that. Aperture is the opening, the size of the opening of the lens. It's expressed in a fraction. We're not going to go in detail to talk about that right now, but I'll just say that the smaller the number, the larger your opening. Lenses generally go from somewhere around, uh, depending on how much you pay, 1.2, 1.4, all the way up to 22, 36 um, in that general range. The f1.4, f2, f2.8, 
those are very large openings, almost as wide as the lens glass itself. On the other end of the spectrum, the 22, F22, F36, those are tiny, tiny openings, just barely large enough for you to insert a pin through. That's your range. F5.6 is, you know, kind of a medium open. Again, expressed in fractions. And finally, your final option here is your ISO, the sensitivity of the sensor. Now, I know that's not great. It's not very explanatory since I'm saying two words and trying to use both of those in the same definition. But the, the larger the number, the more sensitive that sensor is, that little piece of electronic equipment in your camera, to the light coming in. And it's a, fa it's a doubling factor. So at ISO, at ISO 200, it is twice as sensitive as it is at ISO 100. At 400, it's twice as sensitive as it is as it is as 200. I'm going to stop stuttering over my words there, and let's just go back to our main screen. So, let's press Live View now, and it's showing us. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I really think Live View is a great learning tool. I've said that in other videos. And it's showing us the exposure we would get with these current settings: the shutter speed across the bottom, 500th of a second our aperture of 5.0, and our ISO of 400. If we half press the shutter, you can see that the camera helpfully says, this is where I think your exposure is uh, relative to a correct one. Correct one should be right there in the middle, what the camera thinks is a correct one. And again, remember what the camera thinks is a correct one and what you want as a correct one are not always the same. Often they're very similar when you're just trying to take regular pictures but they're not always the same. And I don't know if you noticed, but it did move a little bit um, based on the amount of light coming in through the skylight, uh, whether or not it's bright brightening the scene or um, darkening the scene. So let's start to adjust our values of these settings to get a more correct exposure. First thing I'm gonna do, the shutter speed is already selected. One 500th of a second is pretty fast. I can go a lot slower than that before I run into any kind of negative um, effects. Do you know what those negative effects might be? Did anybody out there say motion blur? Now, that is correct. In this situation, the camera is sitting still. It's taking a picture of very still life. Nothing is moving. So you could go to shutter speeds very, very slow, multiple seconds, and there wouldn't necessarily be any negative impact on your image. And that would still give you a correct exposure. Let's do that just for fun. Let's go all the way down and take a picture one second long. I dialed, it says one. Now my image, of course, is really overexposed. I'm gonna go to 100. That makes the sensor as less sensitive as possible. And now, by holding down the AV button, I can dial the aperture way up. And notice, 22 is the maximum for this lens. And the camera is now saying that I am overexposing slightly from what it believes to be a correct image, but this is actually very close to the image that I want to create here. And I'm going to go ahead and press the shutter button. It's going to take a picture. It took one second to take that picture. Let's go and put that on the screen for a second and get rid of all of the info. But you can see one second, F22, ISO 100. And there's my image. And everything is fine. We should be able to zoom in on those flowers. And they are a little bit brighter than I would like, but everything is crisp and the image is just fine. We should also notice that the plant in the background, although dark, is in focus. We'll talk about that in just a second more. Now, that was the example of going that. But what if I was taking pictures, what if I was holding the camera, or if I was taking pictures of people moving? Well, those are two different things. So let's say first, if I was holding the camera and taking a picture of this flower, the one thing that you wanna watch out for is shutter speed slow enough that you won't be able to hold the camera steady during them. If I picked up this camera and held it for one second, the image would be very, very blurry. The general rule of thumb is that your shutter speed should be a bit higher than your focal length. 
Right now I'm shooting with a 35 millimeter lens. My shutter speed should always be above 35. The one time that you can break that rule and you're holding the camera is when you have a lens that has IS. Then you can go a little bit slower. But now let's say you're taking pictures of something that's moving, somebody that's moving, your kid, your toddler, a dog running in the backyard. Now you're talking about shutter speeds that you want to be up around uh, 100, 125th of a second, 125th of a second. Um, that's a pretty good safe shutter speed for movement unless we're talking about things that are moving very fast or you could go a little slower if things are moving a little bit slower. In this case, you can see that my image is now very, very dark. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll my aperture, increase my aperture a good bit. I'll go to 2.8, pretty close. And now I can increase my ISO sensitivity to 400. And those flowers in the foreground are a little bit brighter than I want. I'm going to go back down to 200 for ISO. And now you can see that my exposure is identical, virtually identical, and you can see that little exposure meter at the bottom, virtually identical to uh, the exposure I shot a minute ago that was a one second in F22. But notice there are other differences now. Well, let me go ahead and take this picture. And press playback, here it is. So uh, exposure wise, brightness, it is very, very similar. However, that plant in the background now is very soft and not in focus because I was shooting at such a smaller aperture. So aperture, increases and decreases the size of your lens opening and that allows in um, various amounts of light depending on the size of the opening but it also impacts your depth of field how in focus things are so how i approach each situation is i say well what kind of aperture do i want for this and i set it accordingly then i figure out the shutter speed i need and set that accordingly um, and then if I need to adjust my ISO to get the shutter speed where I want it to be, then I'll do that. So that's usually my approach. Start with the aperture. Um, and an easy way to do this is uh, to shoot on AV mode. Uh, you set your aperture where you want. The camera will set the shutter speed. Um, and you still have to shut your, uh, set your ISO based on that. Um, you could also go to auto ISO if you want. I'm not a big fan of auto ISO. It makes, this is again, letting the camera have a little bit more control. And the more control you let the camera have, the more likely it is gonna be to make a bad decision. It's kind of a bummer. We do have these really expensive, really nice cameras, but they, um, they're just not as smart as us after a little bit of learning and understanding um, these different, uh, how these different settings affect our image quality. So. This was just a really quick, simple look at changing those values, talking a little bit about exposure. I'm gonna come back with more videos that talk in depth. Um, I'd like to have a series of kind of recipes, but really it all depends on what you see and the factors of fast enough to avoid motion blur, fast enough to avoid handshake, um, the, I, the aperture that you want for the scene, whether or not you want to kind of separate somebody from the background or it's a vista and you want to get all of it in focus, then you're going to be shooting at those really high numbers, which is a really small opening. Um, and then the ISO. And the one thing you want to watch out for your ISO with your kind of entry level DSLRs is still around ISO 1600. Above that, we start to get quite noisy. And so if you can keep below that number, um, and the lower the better, usually. Um, then you're going to have a better, a cleaner image. But if you need to go higher to keep that shutter speed from getting blurry uh, or getting long enough that your image is blurry, um, then you're gonna wanna do that because a slightly noisy, non-blurry photo is better than a blurry photo that's not noisy unless you're going for artsy blurry. Welcome to Yosemite National Park. Uh, yes, yeah, so we drove up a little ways to a place called Tunnel View, which is a, an overlook where you can see 
pretty much all of the peaks, I guess. So you yeah. can see El Capitan, you can see uh, Half Dome, and then a bunch of other stuff. It's gorgeous. This morning to, and last night, woke up this morning to mostly blue sky. Yeah. We headed up to the lower Yosemite Falls. There is an amazing view of down the pathway to the falls of both the upper and lower. That was awesome. Yep. It was really cool. We did uh, some time lapses there and uh, some, I think some people put on neutral density filters and try to do some slow shutters. Yep. Stuff. Yeah. Where the light was in and out. Um, I heard some people, uh, Randy said he was shooting in about 30 seconds with his, he's got like a neutral density, I think an eight. I actually want to talk for a moment about how we would capture a scene like this. Uh, huge vista. So first thing I think about is my aperture. I'm going to set that to something nice and deep. Uh, F8 is a good start. F9, F10 is fine. I probably don't need to go beyond that when we're focusing so far off in the distance. Next I want to check my shutter speed and make sure it's fast enough to avoid handshake. I've got a stabilized camera, but you know, I can go a little bit faster than that. And now I'm shooting with the Sony and I've got my exposure right in the middle, just about where I want it. And that looks good. 160th of a second. I'm shooting with the Sony 16 to 35 and I've got it at 16. And so I'm going to line it up just right. I'm going to try to balance looking for my horizon line, making sure I'm not splitting the image perfectly, but I do want to capture uh, just a nice amount of foreground that leads to that iconic El Capitan and then just around the corner is Half Dome and we got Bridal Veil Falls off on the right as well. This looks good. Tripod basics, we've gone over them before, and they're very, very important, and mostly for safety. So the sad thing is we see people drop their cameras, drop their lenses right off the tripod, or juggling things to try to get it on the tripod. So we don't want to see people drop their cameras and break them. So I want to reiterate these safety basics for mounting your camera on your tripod for not only safety, but your best photography results. So your um, most tripods will have a quick release plate and this screws into the tripod attachment on the bottom of your camera. Now, um, some of them have a little lever that you can spin around to tighten but um, you can have also a, use a screwdriver or a little tripod tool, which this is. It has a, a little hex on one side and a flat uh, screwdriver on the other. So we want to make sure this is hand tightened as tight as you can so that there is no movement at all in this plate here. So we want to always make sure that's solid and never moving. So before I mount the camera to the tripod, I want to make sure that the head is rotated around so that the, the knob that tightens the actual physical attachment to the camera is underneath the lens so that you won't accidentally mistake it with these knobs here. And another great tip to do right when you're setting the tripod up is to have this, since this is going to be under the lens, you want the leg of the tripod, create a front leg for stability so that if you tilt the camera down this way, the weight goes down in their support from this leg and it won't accidentally tumble over, especially in a downhill position. So the quick release plate has grooves. They slide in to the back first and then the front. And I check to see, is it in the groove? Yes, it is, so I tighten hand tightened very very tight and then I check it I try to move it and it's so so solid that is what you're going for so now you've taken some great shots in this location and you want to move to the next 
how do we move this camera on the tripod very carefully. <laughs> so we double check our attachment, make sure it's solid, but this is a big no-no. Okay, I don't wanna see any Tom Sawyers walking down the path like this. Okay, you just have, you have no, you, you have no um, eyes on it for one, and for two, it's just not a good practice to, to bounce your camera around mounted to the tripod. If you have a strap on, you can put that around your shoulder as a double safety. Um, but I just really prefer to, to carry it with my hand on the camera and my other hand on the tripod legs and move, moving along without bumping anyone. Okay, and this is another reason why we don't carry the cameras or the tripods like this because you swing around and you're gonna knock someone out and it happens more often than we'd like to see. So lastly, this is a thing that no one thinks they do, but they really do. So you wanna kind of babysit yourself and make sure that you're not doing this. So I wanna adjust my camera slightly to the left, okay? Some people put their hands on it and they, they go, Ugh! I'm turning it, I'm turning it, I'm turning it. What happens here is you're loosening your camera's attachment to the tripod when you do this. I am out here on Ruby Beach on the Olympic Peninsula up in the state of Washington. And we just wanted to bring you a very quick tutorial here and just talk about what we're seeing here. And you know, if you look back here, you can see that the weather doesn't look to be that optimum. And what I mean by that is we came out here, sometimes people are thinking, well, we're gonna go shoot sunset. And this is one of those times that I wanna, I wanna actually encourage you to get out and shoot and think about a different perspective. You know, when we get out and we're thinking about color and sunset and then something like this happens, you know, you might tend to get a little bit discouraged. And I actually think this is awesome. The reason being is my approach is going to be different. It's gonna to be totally different than if I was just coming out here to shoot a beautiful color sunset. Instead, what I'm thinking about is mood. And I'm thinking about uh, the term minimalist and trying to create something that has impact based on the tones that we have. We're asked a lot if we should photograph in color or black and white. And you know, I always say shoot in color. You can always post produce to black and white later. That is my approach. But my thinking can change. So for instance, tonight as we're out here, all the tonality that we see is pretty much a black and white and gray tonality. Because of that, my approach is actually thinking about how would I produce these images in black and white. Now I'm still going to shoot color, just in case, but my thinking is I'm going to be reproducing these images in black and white tones. And I wanna think in terms of simple, and again, that term minimalist. Rather than it being too complicated in my compositions, I'm going to take a look at what I've got here and simplify everything. I'm also going to consider doing some long exposures out at the ocean where the waves and the water goes really smooth. And again, this is all about creating mood. So guys, what am I saying here when it all comes down? It doesn't, you know, change the fact with the weather. When the weather changes or may not be what you think it should be, sometimes the greatest images can come out of those situations. Think about your approach differently when you get out to shoot. In this case, we came out to shoot sunset, the fog set in, but we've got this nice, eerie, and moody feeling, and that's the approach that I'm gonna take. It's a really good idea when you're taking a shot to actually look around the edges of your frame, and the first thing that I noticed was my reflection was actually cut off just at the very bottom. So I simply moved forward to where I could make sure that I got the entire reflection, and then in my setup, I, again, I'm thinking simple. And the first thing I did is I did a horizontal photograph, kind of took in a little bit more of the scenery. There are some people over here on the photograph and I may leave them in their perspective or I may decide to go ahead and, and take them out in you know uh, post-production and editing. Now, after I did my horizontal shot, you know, Toby always talks about when's the best time to take a vertical photograph? The answer, right after you take a horizontal, a horizontal photograph. So basically what I did is I went ahead, turned that camera vertical, and I even simplified it more. I took the one main rock here, photographed that, and the first thing I did was a basic straightforward photograph that uh, basically uh, uh, 
was right at my sweet spot of my, my lens, which is f8. I took that f8 shot, I think it was around a tenth of a second, but then I decided to go for a little bit longer exposure just to make sure that that water was as smooth that as possible. So I took the f-stop up, which forced my shutter speed longer, and this is the result that I got. We're gonna head down to the ocean side here, and we're gonna do uh, some nice long exposures down there. I'm gonna do, so here's the thing, when I go to photograph, if I'm thinking long exposures, I'm also going to take shots that are not just long exposures. I'm gonna do a variety, why not? So you're gonna see me do some shots, maybe a little faster shutter speed, and then some shots with a long exposure, trying to create that mood that we've been talking about. But again, keeping things simple, keeping things in a very minimalist look, and just really going for the tonality and the moods to have thought-provoking images. Down low right now, just for perspective here, and uh, trying to do some long exposures with this water. I gotta be careful, the tide's coming in. Just about got myself a little bit too wet there. Uh, so I gotta be careful with that. But again, I'm just, I'm just trying some long exposures, shooting at a little bit of an angle here with this water and the lines. And again, just going for uh, you know images with a mood. It's all about mood, and that's what I'm looking for right now. thoughts on this. Basically, don't be afraid of the weather. If things don't look and conditions don't look exactly like you had hoped for and expected, just change your approach. Go ahead and simplify things. In this case, with fog and these tones that we're getting out here, I'm just simplifying that approach, going for a very minimalist look and attitude in my approach to photography, thinking about black and white because that's the tonality that we have here, and even keeping my images uh, without being too complicated with the composition and the elements in those photographs. Taking single subjects, uh, like the rock that you saw, and just, again, just keeping everything really simplified. And then, for added mood, even doing some long exposures in a situation where we have water like this to really give it uh, a deep, thought-provoking uh, moment in these images.
we get up early tomorrow and head towards the Tetons. We might see some more animals, but our focus now is shifting to nice landscapes. And we've made our way through Yellowstone, stopping a couple places. Got to see Old Faithful. The timing just worked out really nicely. Some in our group had never seen that before. And now we've entered the Grand Tetons National Park and one of our first views. Look at this. Spectacular. You step up to a scene like this, the first thing I think about is aperture really getting a nice depth of field that's going to capture all of this in focus. And, you know, we talked about taking some just general nice scenics of the mountains in the distance, not splitting your horizon perfectly. But one of the things to look for here is we're surrounded by this little kind of uh, roadside field of flowers and using some of that as interesting foreground element uh, to really give a sense of depth and scale to this scene can be nice. In that case, when you've got stuff really close to the lens, that's when I really start thinking about using those high apertures. It's very rare that I'm shooting up above f11, f12, uh, unless I'm trying to achieve some kind of effect where sharp focus in foreground and something in the very distant is still recognizable. Arguably one of the uh, most photographed landmarks in Grand Tetons National Park, besides the mountains themselves, is the Molten Barn. It's easy to find on Google Maps. There's lots of gorgeous photos of it. We're out here at sunrise. We're gonna make our gorgeous photos. We're not alone. As I said, it's one of the most well-known and photographed barns, so there's a few other photographers here, and as we've discussed from time to time, it's like, kind of like, what's the point of making a picture that so many other people have made? I'm not going to go down that road too far, other than to say, it's really cool to be out here, to see this with my own eyes, and to make my own photo that I can hang on the wall and say, I was there, I have that memory, I took that picture. If you do come photograph this barn, keep an eye out for the intersection, so at certain angles, you can frame the entire barn below the top edge of the mountains. I think that's best. Thumbs up there. At other angles or with wider framing, you, you get the peak of the barn poking up just barely above the mountain. And that to me looks a little sloppy. So think about your composition. We've got, you walk over this little bridge, make your way left. And on this little hill, you've got a quite a nice vantage point. I'm shooting at about 50 millimeters on full frame. Um, there are, are tons of other angles to shoot this at, but if you're breaking the horizon, you want it to look very deliberate. Don't have it a little bit. And in some angles we were working on, kind of the saddle of one of the peaks uh, was just kind of kissing the bottom. And that's not good. I'm being summoned. Holy shit. <laughs> Wow, he's moving. There's always these moments on McKay trips, I think we just hit this one. Um, Schwabacher Road, off of the main road in Grand Tetons National Park, leads down to this little scenic river spot. But you turn to the right and you walk, 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 and you get up to these series of beaver dams where the water right now is so perfectly still except for when the mama duck and baby ducks swim by. It is so perfectly still, offering such fantastic reflections. It's just very lovely.
right now we are in Zion National Park and we are just waiting for sunset. And one of the things that happens with sunset is as the sun comes across the sky and hits the mountain range, what's going to happen is we get some light that's kind of uneven. We get a lot of heavy shadow and a lot of really bright sunlight. And if you take a look up here, you can see that we've got these tips of sunlight, but it's going to get softer and softer and softer in a minute. And as it gets softer, we're going to wait for that color to come in the sky and then hopefully get some great sunset shots. One of the biggest mistakes that happens when I come out with a group, you can see I've got a group behind me here. One of the biggest mistakes that happens is people set up, the sun is hitting, and they're shooting an area with a lot of bright sun and a lot of shadow in the same shot. When that's happening, I just recommend that you isolate on an area, but then wait. That's the key. The real key to sunset photography is patience. You don't need to shoot a thousand shots of the same exact mountain waiting. Just get set, get ready, and then as this light gets softer and then the color comes in the sky, then you're going to be good to go. Hey guys, I'm back at you here. I just wanted to record a little bit more. We've been out here only maybe, maybe five, ten minutes since I last spoke to you. And look at how different already what's happening with the light is. It comes across the horizon now. It's got a different quality. The color is getting warmer and it's a little more golden, but it's not as harsh either. So we've got nice highlight and shadow and we're getting that color in the sky and you can just kind of see what's happening here. Again, the patience is paying off. And so I just wanted to point out how much different just a few minutes can make in taking your photographs. All right, guys. So it's now just been another maybe 15 minutes since my last uh, little talk with you. And boy, oh boy, how things have changed in this last, I mean, literally 45 minutes, we've gone with totally different lighting situations. And now we're getting this beautiful, beautiful color that's coming in, some beautiful golden highlights on the side of the, the mountain there. Uh, and again, it just comes down to patience. Just so you guys know, uh, I am shooting at 100 ISO on a tripod. I'm not worried about how long my shutter's gonna go. The sweet spot of this lens is right at f5.6, so that's what I've gone with, and then I've just adjusted my shutter accordingly, slightly underexposing, which helps bring in a little bit of saturation into that sky. But anyway, that in a nutshell is just showing you how I would shoot a, a beautiful sunset of a mountain range. It doesn't have to be, um, a long drawn out process really it just comes down to patience as far as just watching that color adjusting your settings as you go and you're going to be good to go we are here in secret canyon we are in page arizona this is not antelope canyon this is a canyon we get exclusive access to for over two hours and we've just been doing an amazing uh, tour here with a, a number of our clients and i just wanted to talk to you i'm going to show you some images and these images i just wanted to share i'm in uh, a lot of difficult light where we've got beautiful highlights and then also shadows but it gives this beautiful texture beautiful light and this is one of those places where I tend to use a large f-stop for aperture I will, I will use like an f22 or with this lens I can go to f32 and that allows me to get depth from foreground all the way back does force me to do a long shutter speed because I want to be at 100 ISO which is the best quality so uh, you know, this is one of those places where we always talk about, you know, your aperture being, you know, we don't never, you know, a lot of times we don't have to go past, say, f8 in most situations. But this is a situation, just wanted to share with you, it's a specific situation where it's a good idea when you have a lot of depth of field to go ahead, take that f-stop up high, use a tripod, 100 ISO, and if your shutter ends up being a 10 second exposure in a location like this, no problem. We are out here in Marble Canyon, just outside of Page, Arizona. We've brought the McKay Photography Academy group out here on tour, and uh, we're out here at this balance rock, and you can see behind me how awesome this is. And one of the things that I wanna share with you folks, it's just, it's a small tip, but it's a huge difference in the composition and quality of what your photograph may look like. And that is, if you look behind me right here, you can see that there's a lot of, uh, there, the, the mountain back here, that there's space between the mountain it leads down and it comes into our rock right here but there's space in between and it's really nice it's a nice separation it's almost like that rock just fits in to that spot really really well and the mountain here is leading us right down to our main subject now watch this I'm only gonna move just a few feet this way 
And as I do this, you're now going to notice that that mountain intersects right into the rock. It's not nearly as strong compositionally. So I'm always trying to tell our clients, look at your subject, but then look beyond your subject. Look what's happening behind your main subject. Sometimes the difference of three feet makes a huge difference in the composition of your photograph. So we have it intersecting here. Let's move back to where you can see it's getting better as we go. But then if I come this way even more, and if I take this shot, now there's a lot of separation, too much separation. So the difference between literally from here, three feet and three feet is the difference between a really good composition and poor composition. Now that's just a quick tip, but it can have a huge impact on your photograph because that is not something that you can just simply Photoshop in or out. So we wanna get it right in camera. We are out here with McKay Photography Academy doing another tour. We are in a back road somewhere in Utah and uh, we came across this incredible scene that's out here. Uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, different layers in this canyon. We've got this blue sky with puffy clouds. And the tendency here is to go ahead and photograph and shoot the entire scene. And I, I recommend that. Uh, here's a shot that I did with that where you see the entire scene. But one of the things that people don't tend to do is think about getting in nice and tight and zooming in close and just filling the entire frame of just the area that without the sky. So in this case back here where we have the mountains, we have the different layers, we have the rivulets. That's a word I learned from Tovi, by the way. And we have all that. We can get in really, really tight. So within the scene, we have a couple different really awesome opportunities to photograph. So it's not about one or the other, but I definitely recommend when you find a scene like this that you do both. Don't ever hesitate to get the whole scene and then just pick and choose one nice little area that's very, very interesting for composition and just to come up with something completely different. Another amazing place out in the West is Joshua Tree National Park. Now, one of the things about Joshua Tree is we find that the best thing to do there is to photograph at night. We typically go in July or August when it is super hot during the day, but we love the evenings out there. As you can see here, it is an amazing time to do star photography, and that is what we love to do out of Joshua Tree. Uh, be sure to take lots of water with you when you're out there, and 29 Palms is a great place to stay and have great access.
I'm coming to you from Katmai National Park in Alaska and we've been doing a lot of nature photography and wildlife photography up here and I wanted to share a tip with you about not compromising your shutter speed to get a better quality ISO. So some of the time when it's overcast or when it's later in the day or even before sunrise, the light's low and people may be concerned with using a high ISO, which would give you lower quality. And yes, that is true. However, we don't really ever want to compromise our shutter speed if it's a moving subject or if it's a situation where we need to compensate for lens shake with a heavy lens. So always make sure you have a fast enough shutter speed to stop that action and also to compensate for your movement of holding this heavy lens and make sure you stop that action with a fast enough shutter speed. So what you can do is check your playback, always check your images and zoom in on the playback and make sure that that action, the fastest moving part of that, just let's just say it's a bear jumping after a fish. Let's just really make sure that that stopped. You see the individual water droplets separated and that is much more important than you being afraid to use a higher ISO. This is a beautiful winter wonderland but it's really, really, really cold. It's minus 15 right now. The second that this video is done filming, I'm jumping back in the warm car because my face is starting to freeze up <laughs> and I can't pronunciate the words as well. But okay, so with equipment, we're out shooting the Aurora last night and it's cold and cameras can get finicky, but especially batteries. Batteries like to be warm like me <laughs> so how we uh, will store our extra batteries our backup batteries is next to our body heat so in an interior pocket or placing the battery right next to a hand warmer okay we'll keep it warm and it will be ready to go when your battery needs replacing and what we found is sometimes your camera is telling you your battery has zero power in it. And what we found uh, just from experience is when you warm that very battery up that your camera is claiming it has no power, all of a sudden sometimes it can have full power. So it was just really kind of whining and complaining that it's cold. So sometimes you can warm that battery up and it'll be good to go again but always, always have your spares on a hand warmer and or near your interior warmth of your body because they're very finicky, those little batteries. They don't like to be cold. I think they'd rather live somewhere like Florida, <laughs> but we bring them to places like this <laughs> and they, we just have to deal with them and, and just kind of baby, baby their temperament. Let's talk about the Aurora, Aurora Borealis, also known as the Northern Lights. Now in the West, there is a place up in Alaska, just outside of Fairbanks, uh, that you can witness this amazing phenomenon and also learn to photograph it. It's known as Aurora Bear. It's a great place to go. We also lead tours up there. Uh, photographing the Aurora is like nothing else that you've ever experienced and it's something that everybody should at least try and see once in their lifetime. Again, there are a number of places that you can go to see it, but really uh, just outside of Fairbanks, up in Alaska, it's definitely one of the best places in the world to see it. And our friends up there at Aurora Bear are who we highly recommend.